Hi everyone, in today's class, we will be discussing the topic of temperature control and ventilation. This falls under section B of your syllabus, unit 1. And this is part 1 of 2 videos that I will be uploading for you. Let's look at our objectives for today. Firstly, we are going to describe the methods of heat transfer and their applications which are conduction, convection, and radiation. We're also going to, to mention land and sea breezes. We are going to explain the principle by which thermostatically controlled household appliances operate, such as electrical and gas ovens, as well as electrical irons. Now, these items have something called a bimetallic strip, which we will be looking at in detail. Now, how is heat transferred? There are three main methods of heat transfer. Those are conduction, convection, and radiation. We will first look at conduction. Now, let's say, for example, these diagrams here represent rods. That's R-O-D-S, right? This is a non-metal rod, meaning it can be plastic, wood, rubber, styrofoam, or anything that is just not a metal. And this one is a metal rod. Now, if you remember from your form tree chemistry, say for example, aluminum. In aluminum, its outer electron orbital had three electrons. These are also called free electrons when it is in its metallic state. So these free electrons are represented by these red dots here. And these are the other atoms, all right? So normally, at room temperature, these electrons would be vibrating, right? So when it is heated, these electrons gain energy and they begin to move rapidly. They gain kinetic energy. And it's that movement of um, electrons that is what increases the temperature, right? So when the electrons bounce into their neighboring electrons and neighboring particles, the temperature of the whole metal will increase rapidly. And this would make them good conductors of heat. Now for non-metals now, they do not contain these free electrons. So if you look here, you don't see these little red dots, right? So very little heat transfer takes place between its particles. Yes, you can heat it, it can catch fire, but there will not be much transfer along the rod, right? And this is what makes them poor conductors of heat, or you can also call them good insulators. Let's look at convection. So convection is the movement of air and liquid due to different densities of heated particles. Say for example, we have a, a pot of water and we are going to heat up that pot of water, right? So at a more um, atomic level, right? This is what it would look like. So at the very bottom of the pot, in the very center of the heat, the particles that are closest to the heat will heat up first. Now, when something is heated, it expands and its density decreases. So when its density decreases, it rises up. As this rises up, the cooler and more dense region of molecules fall to take its place. And then when, it, when the cooler molecules reach here, they then heat up again and rise. And then other cooler molecules try to take its place. So this circular movement continues until the entire temperature gets uniform. Okay? Uh, say for example as well, we put a crystal of potassium permanganate in a beaker of water and we heat it. Now this is like a little crystal of sugar. So as you heat it, you'll actually see a stream of purple dye going up and then it will cool down and then return to the bottom, right? And you will continue seeing that circular movement until the entire beaker is purple. This concept can also be used for ventilation fans. You know those fans you would see in restaurants or in garages, right? So it uses the same concept of getting warm air from the current 
and then it cools it down. So this circular movement is referred to as convection currents and can be found in water heaters, ovens and refrigerators. The next method of heat transfer is radiation. So both conduction and convection require particles to transfer heat. We saw this in the last few slides. Radiation, however, transfers heat using infrared waves or electromagnetic radiation. So solids and liquids are not necessary for radiation to take place. Our bodies feel radiation as warmth. So let's say, for example, you step out of a cold room into um, warm air. You'll feel that warm air radiating onto your skin from either the ground or from a roof. Electromagnetic radiation can be transferred through gases or in a vacuum. So through a vacuum, this is how we get heat energy from the sun. Remember in space, there's no air, it's a vacuum. And this is how heat will travel to the earth. And I'm sure you've heard of UV radiation. This is one form of radiation that comes from the sun. Radiation can be reflected or absorbed. So say for example, we have different types of surfaces, a mirror or a shiny surface, or even a galvanize, right? This will reflect radiation. Shiny surfaces reflect radiation. Dull surfaces or dark surfaces such as asphalt, this will absorb radiation and it will emit it as heat energy. So let's look at again a pot of water being heated. So as the, the pot sits on the burner, the direct contact between the burner and the pot will be conduction, right? The heat that you will feel from the burner, remember you are not touching this hot pot, you will feel it radiating onto your skin. And also in order to heat this pot of water, the hot um, pot will warm up the water to the bottom, the water will rise, and then the cooler water to the top will rush in to take its place, which forms a convection current. So just a simple thing as boiling a pot of water will show you three different types of heat transfer. This is just a summary of the heat transfers. So conduction is the direct flow of heat through a material. Convection is a heat transfer of a surface and adjacent fluid, which can be gas or air. And radiation it's the transfer of thermal energy or heat energy through matter by electromagnetic waves. Thermostats. A thermostat is a device that automatically regulates temperature or that activates a device when the temperature reaches a certain point. So thermostats essentially controls your temperature. You don't want your AC getting too cold or your fridge getting too cold or even your flat iron or your heater you don't want them getting too hot all right so there is a certain device in all of these appliances called a thermostat which helps to regulate a certain temperature a bimetallic strip is an important component of thermostats it consists of two strips of different metals bonded together now let's look at the, bi the bimetallic strip. Now a bimetallic strip is just a strip of metal, of two metals, all right? So for example, we have this strip contains brass and steel. The strip is straight at room temperature. When it is hotter than normal temperature, the brass will expand, but there's no place really for the brass to go other than to bend. So the more it is heated, the more it will bend and it will go towards the outside path of the curve. Now, if it is colder than the temperature you need, the brass will contract and it contracts and it becomes 
the inside of the curve. So this movement of bending down or bending upwards, this can disconnect or reconnect a circuit. And this is very important in thermostats. So in an electric iron, the bimetallic strip is straight at room temperature. So if you look at a little circuit here, this is the bimetallic strip. The top part is brass and the bottom is iron. Current flows through the circuit and the heater increases in temperature in order to be used. So the current heats up this part here and this will continue to heat up the bimetallic strip. Now if the temperature gets too high, the brass expands downwards away from the contact. So if you look at, at it here, the brass expands downwards, which means it will expand this way and it's going to break the contact, meaning it's going to break the circuit. When it breaks the circuit, the heater is disconnected and it prevents further heating from taking place. So after a certain temperature, the heater will disconnect and it will stop heating up. Then it will cool down, the bimetallic strip will straighten and then it will start to heat up again. Gas thermostats. Now thermostats are also present in gas ovens. So imagine you are standing on the side of your stove and this knob here would be your control knob to control the temperature inside your oven. All right. So the thermostat in here uses an alloy made of steel and nickel and it is called an invar. Right now, an alloy is just a mixture of two metals, two or more metals. When it is heated, this invar will expand and it moves slightly to the left. So when it moves to the left, this um, valve here will close in a little bit. Now when it closes in, this will cause the gas to be restricted and less gas will go to the burner. When the oven cools down now, the inva will move to the right and when it moves to the right, it's going to push open here a little bit and this will cause more gas to go into the oven and therefore allow the gas to flow and increase the temperature of the oven. You can also use the control knob to alter the position of the valve to keep a steady temperature of the oven. So let's take a look at what we learned today. Heat can be transferred through conduction, that's direct contact, convection through fluids and radiation through electromagnetic radiation or without any particles. Metals are good conductors of heat Non-metals are poor conductors of heat or insulators. Convection currents are present in land and sea breezes, boiling water and fridges. Thermostats help to maintain temperature control using bimetallic strips. All right, so that is the end of it for today. Please look out for a review sheet um, with some questions on it and you will have to submit this online for me. In the meantime, you can also look out for another video and you can do some reading in the textbooks. Alright, so that's it for today. Bye!